Everybody. There we go. Hello, uh, my name is Brandon Notgrass. I am a I am the fiance of Sydney Rutledge. Um, a little bit about myself, just so any of you all who do not know me can know me. Uh, I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri. I uh, came up here to find that it is not cold here all year round like I was thinking it was going to be. Uh, sometimes it's very hot. Um, I'm 25, about to turn 26 years old starting Wednesday, uh, which is crazy to me because I forgot my own birthday was happening. So Sydney made fun of me the other day that I'm starting to lose my memory already. <laughs> Thank you, Sydney. I know you're listening. Um, so, I wasn't meaning to, but uh, I'm kind of building off of Brother Dana's lesson this morning. So, Brother Dana this morning uh, talked about hope and hope that we have uh, in our lives uh, because we as human beings uh, tend to sin, and it is through God and through His grace that we have the hope of salvation. Tonight's lesson uh, is about sin as well, and about more so uh, that hope as well, uh, talking uh, about uh, praying, uh, talking about praying to God and asking Him for help while we are on our, on our planet here in our lives, in our human lives. So you're gonna have to excuse me uh, right now because I use a lot of ums right now and I'm trying to get myself comfortable because I haven't done any preaching since about summer of 2017. So I'm a little, a little rusty over here. Um, I did uh, a Bible study a, a few days ago, not a few days ago, a few weeks ago. Uh, with one of my coworkers, we have been talking about the Bible uh, more. We've been talking about uh, what is the true church? How do we know what the true church is? And we've been talking about sin. And one of the questions that this particular person had brought up to me was the fact that, well, the devil makes you do everything, so how can we fight? You know, the devil, who is so powerful that he makes us sin and he makes us do these things. And I said, it's not the devil who makes you do these things, which is true. The devil doesn't make you do something. The devil throws out a temptation. And you are the one who chooses whether or not to go into that. And I, I brought up the example of Adam and Eve. So the story of Adam and Eve, uh, I'm sure as everyone here knows, you know, God created the earth, seven days, created Adam, gave him a beautiful wife, gave him Eve, they had kids, the Garden of Eden, and they ruined it. And they ruined it because they did the one thing that God asked them not to do. Don't touch that tree, don't look at the tree. Don't think about the tree. Stay away from this particular tree of knowledge. And Eve was tempted, and Eve ate of the tree, and she gave it to Adam, who was there also, and he ate of it as well. The serpent didn't force Eve to eat of that fruit. He didn't say, okay, Eve, you're going to, to stay here, and I'm going to force feed you this fruit. And neither did Eve say, okay, Adam, it's now your turn. The serpent said, you see this? If you eat this, you'll be like God. And Eve saw it and was like, wow, that looks great. I want to be like God. I want to know things. So he didn't make her eat it. She chose willingly to eat it. And then she offered it to Adam and Adam was like, sure, I'll take that too. She didn't force him to eat it. So when we sin as people, we get caught in trouble. 
we tend to point the fingers at somebody else. It was this person's fault that we did that. It was this individual's fault that we did that. This group, it was Satan. They made us do this. When it wasn't at all them who made us do it, it was us who made us. We chose to do it. They just threw it out there. Satan just threw out the temptation. The friends were, were there drinking. The, 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 the co-workers were there cursing. It was the, you know, whatever it was, the situation. And you were the one who chose to participate. And so, when we look at sin, and we look at sin in our own lives, responsibility needs to be taken. Because sin is not other people's fault, it is our own fault. It is definitely the devil's fault and other people's faults that they tempted us, and that's wrong of them. But it is our fault for participating in it. And James 4.14 uh, four, not 4.14, I'm sorry. James 4.17, I can't even read my own handwriting. James 4.17 says, Whoever knows the right thing but fails to do it, it is a sin. You remember when you were a kid, or, you know, if you're a kid, you know what I'm going to be talking about right now, for sure. Um, when your parents say, don't do this thing, and you're like, Why? Because I said so. Well, okay. But why? They're looking out for you. Why do this? Why? When I was a kid, I used to, I used to do front flips off, of our, off the roof of our home. My parents always got on to me because I was a little daredevil. Uh, they were like, don't do that. And I was like, why? Because I was a kid who always asked the question, why? And it really annoyed my parents. Um, and they were like, you're going to get yourself hurt. You're going to either break your leg. You're going to uh, get yourself paralyzed. You're going to hurt yourself in some way. And then, then what? And I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. If I knew that was the possibility of me, you know, jumping off, a front, doing front flips off the roof of the house, I probably wouldn't have done it in the first place. But to me, I just thought I was looking cool. But if you know something's right, if you know, like, keep your hand out of the cookie jar, you know, don't talk back to your parents, you know, um, whatever it is, and you, and you do the wrong anyways, do you not get in trouble? Do you not get spanked or grounded or put in time out or getting things taken away from you? You do because you know what's right and you chose to go the opposite way. And you can't say, well, it was my imaginary friend Steve over here who made me do this. It was Grandpa who told me to, that it was okay to, to do it. I wouldn't get in trouble. It was the neighbor down the street. It was the dog who, who did that. Can't blame anybody else. Got nobody else to blame. You chose that. You did it. Face the consequences. And uh, it's, like, it's, like a, it's like a game of hot potato, you know? Uh, you ever play hot potato? I'm not talking about like the board game hot potato. I'm talking like actual hot potato where you pull the potato out of the oven and then you're like hot potato. You take the hot potato and you throw it to somebody else. Uh, that's not my sin to <laughs> throw it off to somebody else. It's, not, it's not, my, not my potato. I don't want that. That's not my problem. Sounds really familiar in Adam and Eve, you know? Adam, why'd you eat this tree? It wasn't me, it was the woman. Eve, what'd you do? It wasn't me, it was the serpent. You can't hot potato your sin. You can't just take that and be like, that wasn't my fault. I didn't do it on purpose. It was Satan. It was this person, that person. You can't do that, especially on the day of judgment when God is reading through everything that you've done and you looking at your life and everything you said, everything you did, and he's holding you accountable to it, as said in Romans 2.12 and in Matthew 12.36. 
You can't say on day of judgment in front of God, well, it wasn't my fault that I did that. It wasn't my fault I turned out this way, that I thought these thoughts, that I did these things, that I went a certain direction when I should have gone this direction. God's like, I know everything you did. I just told you everything you did. You can't pass that off to somebody else. That's your problem. And you're going to have to answer to it. And the flesh, with all these temptations out in the world, talking about responsibility here, um, it is very enticing. There are things in this world that Satan has used to, to tempt us, to bring us to be desirable. You know, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh. There are things in this world that we see every day, every week, every year that are just designed to bring us closer to these consumable, quick, happy joys. You know, you will not be happy unless you get the brand new car. Well, you don't want to pay for that car. Maybe if you do a little bit of gambling, maybe you could get that car. What about, you know, uh, you know the internet, all the things that are on the internet? There are very scandalous things on the internet. What if some site pops up? Oh... Single boys, single ladies. What about some of these? Friends are out, you know, going to uh, parties. There's going to be drinking there. There's going to be drugs there. You don't want to be the odd one out. You want to be popular like the rest of us. You got to come to this party. Oh. Social popularity see it on TV all the time. You see it, all these people, these, uh, for example, uh, like Iron Man from the Marvel movies. The guy's just a terrible person. He drinks too much, he parties too much, he sleeps around, he does, he's a very immoral person, and yet he's built up to be a hero that kids can look up to and be like, whoa, I'm be just like him. I want him to be like I want to be like Iron Man. I want to be cool like him. All these things are put up in here and is drawn, drawing our attention and is pulling us in every different direction. And it makes us weak because it's so constant in our face and in, in the TV that we read and the books that at TV that we see and the books that we read in our everyday life. It's just there, present at all times. And then there's being here and being able to worship and to be able to be around great and good things and holy things. And it's hard when we're here only a couple hours a week to be around brothers and sisters in Christ and then be out in the rest of the world the other times and still maintain our light in a world that's constantly trying to take our desire to be elsewhere. And some people find it extremely hard to stay that light. Their light dims, their light tends to blow out throughout the week. And so there's this constant war within yourself the war between succeeding what you want, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, to do the things that other people do so that you could be like this or like that or to get what you want, something that looks so desirable but is not giving you what you need. The world is so full of things that give you what you want but not what you need. Like you may need food, but it's not going to fill you spiritually. You may need water, but it's not going to quench your thirst spiritually. 
You may need shelter, big houses, whatnot, but it's not going to protect you spiritually. You may be popular, but you're not going to be popular in the eyes of the one that matters. In James 4.1, I'm going to read this verse. It says, where do wars and fights come from among you? And by the way, I am reading from the New King James Version. Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures, adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore he says, God resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble. In Galatians 5, 17, it says the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. Naturally, we want certain things. Naturally, we want to do certain things. We want to be a part of certain things, but we cannot. As Christians, we are to turn against what we physically want to get what we spiritually need. We turn away from the things that are going to separate us from God, to be closer with God, to give us what we are in need of. And we need that daily. We need that hourly. We need that minutely. We need that every second to fight against the constant pressures. And have you ever been at work? Like, for example, have you ever been at work and you've been there and... I'll move this over for a second. Have you ever been at work and you just... You know, when you first start off a job, they give you through a list of details, a list of protocols that you have to, look, have to learn, memorize, and abide by every time you're there. You got, to, you got to do this thing a specific way. You got to say something and handle something a certain way. And you have to do this to the T. It's exhausting. It's exhausting to do all of these protocols, all these rules, all these little laws that your work provides every single second of every day, especially in high stress environments when you know you can't get to it all. It's hard to, and you're just like, oh, forget it. I'll just <laughs> shortcut it this way. I'll do that later. Uh, they won't see if I don't do that. You get burnt out because you're, you know, you're coming off of a long shift and you're just wanting to go home and they're just like, you got to do it this way. And you're just like, I don't want to. I don't want to. The manager's not doing it. Why should I do it? Those laws and protocols are there for a reason. They're there to keep you safe. They're there because something has happened in the past that put those there in the first place. And they're there to protect you. They're there to provide certain documentation. They're there to, for some reason, they're not just there for no reason at all. And that's the Bible, you know? It, it, we got a list of laws that we're supposed to follow every single second of every day, no matter how tired we are, no matter how much we're just like, can I shortcut that? Can I do this? Can I do that? Can I just not, can he not see me for a second while I'm doing, doing, doing this over here? That's not how that works. We shouldn't do that. Those there are those are there for a reason.
And we need to be careful because when we let our wills slip, when we're tired and exhausted and the constant pressures of life are coming down on us, that's when the devil attacks. You know, First Peter 5, 8, the devil's a roaring lion. He doesn't attack you when you're ready, when you're here at, you know, church and you're just like, I, nothing can, can break me down right now. I see you, Satan, get off to the side. You just take him by the face and shove him down, the, down into the ditch. No, he's, you're not, he's not going to attack you when you're at your strongest. He's going to wait till you have a moment of weakness, till your will is weak, and then he's going to be like, now I see you sucker punch you right in the face and it hits you so hard and then you got this war inside yourself and you don't know what to do because it came out of left field and you weren't really prepared for it and now you're just like what am I going to do with this don't act on it he's not shoving it down your throat he's just putting it right there in your face We got to be like, I don't know how many of you guys are nerds or not, but I'm a, I'm a pretty big nerd. Uh, Green Lantern. I'm a fan of Green Lantern. Green Lantern is awesome. He's this guy, you know, he's up in space and he fights aliens and he beats back the bad guys with his will, sheer power of will. He fights the armies of darkness with will, with his like little light ring and he, with willpower. Isn't that awesome? Got to be like Green Lantern. When the devil's coming up and sucker punching us in the jaw with all these temptations and is trying to cause up a little war within ourselves, we've got to be like Green Lantern and say, not today. Get back. But sometimes we even, we fall into a pattern of sin and we don't even know it. You know, sometimes we're, we think we're strong and then there's like a little hint of weakness somewhere in our lives that we don't even realize it. It could be with our family, it could be with our friends, it could be with our coworkers, or even our entire place of business. It could be with our kids, it could be with our grandparents, it could be with our parents, and grandkids. That there's something going on that you don't realize it, but you're allowing Satan to just cause a little bit of a war inside of you and you don't even realize it yet. A house doesn't fall from the rot without, it falls from the decay within. And that's one of Satan's strategies of attack, is to attack you from within as well as without. You may be strong on the without attacks, on the external attacks, but how are you on the internal? You know, there's a, a story, and I won't get into too much detail as to not gross out anybody here, but the how Eskimos hunt wolves, where they take the blade, they dip it in blood, freeze it, and stick it face up in the snow. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that or not, but long story short, the wolf smells the blood, licks the, the blood off the, the blade, doesn't realize it's the blade by the time his tongue is numb, He's cutting himself and hurting himself and doesn't even realize it yet. We can't be like that. Nobody's making that wolf eat that, that blade. And I'm sure there's plenty of other wildlife out there. He just so happened to choose that one. We can't let the internal things beat us. We gotta be sharp, we gotta let our wills be strong at all times, our guards gotta be up. Like I said, it can even be in the stuff that we watch too. You know, we got movies, we got stories, constantly, we love stories. I'm a big story guy, I love stories. I like to write stories sometimes. Stories, a good story, involves conflict. A story without conflict is a boring story. In the, in the parables, there were conflict in there. Parable of the lost son. What made that story 
interesting was that the sun ran, that, is that the sun ran away and then he came back. We have all these stories out here that involve something terrible happening, some conflict, and then something good happens later. And we, we strive for that. We love stories. Stories are amazing. It, something that we can relate to, something that we all can do together. It brings us closer to each other, whether it be movies, books, you know, stories of our ancestors. But there could even be some stories that we put into our heads that don't even need to be in there in the first place. Like I said, stories are all about conflicts. That's what makes a great story. The more conflict in the story, the better the story becomes. And one of the greatest conflicts is sin and is the sinful acts that create that conflict. And there's some movies out there with so much sin in it, or TV shows, or what have you, that don't have, have no business being in here, and have no business being inside of our minds. Like I said, the Marvel movies, those heroes, I like the Marvel movies, don't get me wrong, I like the Marvel movies, but those heroes aren't really heroes. Most of them are immoral. And murderers, alcoholics, terrible role models. And the little kids want to be them, and they'll be like, wow. I want to be like the Hulk. I want to be so angry that I just like, whoa, and start beating up stuff and tearing down buildings. Oh, come on, man. You don't want to be like that. You don't want to be angry all the time. That's not a good role model to be. I mean, it's cool to be like big and green, but I mean, my grandfather has a saying, garbage in, garbage out. Whatever you put into your head is going to eventually come out. It's going to come out in your actions. It's going to come out in the things that you say and the things that you do. You got to be careful. You got to keep your guard up. Because like I said, like Peter says, the devil's a roaring lion. Sometimes he's going to come at you in front. Sometimes he's going to be silent about it and coming through the back. And you know, everybody is looking for something in this world to make them happy. We got this sort of need to feel appreciated by people, to feel happiness. That's why we collect so much stuff. I don't know about how many of you all collect things. You know, you're thinking, oh, if I just have this, I'll be a little happier. This, I'll have this, I'm going to be happy. I'm going to have this, you know, this coin is going to complete my collection, and yes, be so happy once I get that collection completed. Cars, if I get this car here, oh yeah, I'm gonna be, gonna be great. If I, if I have this specific item to add to my shelf of stuff, I'll be great. People want happiness in, in, the, in the type of social status that they have. You know, if I can just be popular with this group, then I'm gonna be it. I'm gonna be excited, happy, everything's gonna be great. Everybody's looking for something to fill in that, that hole for happiness. But nothing's going to fill in that hole. Nothing but God is. You know, I hear, the, I hear these, these songs like, uh, I listen to a lot of blues music. Because uh, I'm from St. Louis, I listen to a lot of blues music. That's where it originated from. Uh, I was listening to a song this morning, actually, by a man named Sam Cooke. Uh, and he was singing the song, I need somebody to ease my troubling mind. And that's the song, that's the lines of the song. I need somebody to ease my troubling mind. And he's asking for a, a woman to help ease and talk to his troubles about. If I could just have a partner in life, if I could just have a, a girlfriend, a boyfriend, if I could just have somebody in my life that I can tell my problems to, that'll be it. Be at peace, I'll be happy. Shel Silverstein wrote The Missing Piece. I like Shel Silverstein. 
wrote about this little Pac-Man looking thing and how it was rolling around and looking for its missing piece. And it found its piece and they were so happy together until the piece started growing and growing and growing and then the two separated. And then it was like, well, I guess I'm gonna go back and look for my missing piece and just kept rolling and rolling and rolling. The whole thing is an allegory for relationships. You don't need somebody to fill in that happiness because they're not going to fill in that happiness. Not all completely, not that, that hole in your chest that you, so des that you so crave. Only God is going to fill in that hole. You have a relationship with God. God is your missing piece. Your relationship with him, he's your missing piece. He's that somebody to ease your troubling mind. God can help us in our struggle. I ask you all to please turn to Philippians 4, 6 through 9, please. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 9. says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. These things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be upon you. God is there for us no matter what. We may be going through some things, you know, we may have lost somebody that we cared deeply about. We may be struggling to maintain our, our willpower. We may be dealing with some issue in our family. We may be dealing with some issues with our friends. And it may be causing a bit of a war within ourselves, within our very person. We rely on God through everything. He will be with us. He will guide us. He will protect us. And that's what we need, is we need to pray to God. We need to ask God every day for several things. We gotta to pray to him, we gotta love him, we gotta do what he says. This isn't, this isn't a hard book to know, to, 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 to know what you're supposed to do. You know, you can read through this thing really easily. You can know everything that God wants from us. but we tend to make it a lot more difficult than what it needs to be. Satan tends to twist it up in our minds, making us think things, thinking, oh, this is too hard. I can't do this. I'm not good enough for this. At least you're not Apostle Paul, who kicked in the doors of, you know, Christians in the early church grabbing the men and the women by the hair, dragging them out of their homes. I'm sure some of them had kids who were screaming and throwing them in prison. He became a Christian. He knows what he did. Satan didn't make him do it. He chose to do that because he thought he was doing what was right. But he turned around in the end and regretted it and held on to his faith. And if he can do that, 
we can do whatever. We can take whatever challenge is coming in on our person, whatever temptation, whatever war is brewing on, and we can fight it off and we can maintain it. We can be a Christian. We don't have to say that we're not good enough because God tells us we are good enough. So don't get it twisted. He says, love me. You see what I'm telling you to do? Just obey what little laws that I have. Follow these little protocols. Don't play hot potato with your sins. Okay? Talk to me. I'm here for you. So that's what we should do. Talk to God. Talk to God. Ask him. Pray for him. Pray, pray to him for protection. Say, God, I need you to protect me from temptation. I need you to protect me from whatever desires are going on that are physically taking me in a direction that I do not like, is spiritually taking me in a direction I do not like. I need you to protect me from those. Psalms 91 verses 2 through 6 says, God is my fortress. You pray to God, ask him to be your protector. He will be your fortress. He will be your refuge. He will be your shield, and he will protect you under his wing from anything. That's what Psalms 91, 2 through 6 says. You come to me, I am your shield. Nothing will get through this. Pray to him for strength. God, give me the strength to overcome the sinful desires that I have. If you're in an addiction, help me to overcome the sinful habits that I have. Give me the strength to beat this. In Exodus 15, verse 2, God is your strength. God will give you the victory over whatever challenge comes. In Isaiah 41, verse 10, it says, Do not fear. God will strengthen you. You ask for strength, God will give you strength. Another thing is pray for wisdom. God, give me the, sh the wisdom to recognize when sin is at my door, when Satan is coming up and just about to sucker punch me in the face with temptation. Give me the wisdom to recognize that and step away from it. Or if you, it's a subtle thing, give me the wisdom to realize what subtle things are going on right now so that I can get away from it. Give me the wisdom to stay away from it, to recognize where it's coming from so that I can walk away. James 1, verses 5 through 8. You ask for it wholeheartedly, not thinking, oh, I may be wise after this, I may not, I don't know if it'll work. No, don't do that. Matthew 7, verses 7 through 11, don't doubt his gifts because if you doubt his gifts, he's not going to give it to you. It says in James and it says here in Matthew. God will give you wisdom if you ask for it. And of course, we're all going to sin because it's a struggle every day. It's a hard struggle. Apostle Paul was not perfect at all. He was like, every day is a war inside my person. Every day I have to fight against myself and strengthen myself because it's hard. It's not easy. Pray for forgiveness. Galatians 6 verse 2 Church, we're supposed to be there for each other. We're supposed to talk to each other. Talk to each other about whatever problems are going on in our lives. 
We're supposed to bear each other's burdens on each other. We may be different. We're all different. We all come from different backgrounds, ethnicities, places, and statuses. But we all have one purpose. That purpose is to worship God, get to heaven. We're in it together. We're a family. Why don't we be a family? Be there for each other. We're the greatest gift to each other. To be there. Highs and lows. Pray for forgiveness, pray for protection, pray for strength, pray for wisdom. And we get a family. With all of these things, we can fight the war within ourselves. And we can win. We can finish the race. We can get to that hope. We can do anything. The song I need thee every hour is a perfect song for this lesson. I'm really glad it got sung tonight. I really am. That was a good choice. We need God every hour because every hour we're at war. The spiritual war. Spiritual war with ourselves. Flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Let's help strengthen each other. Thus, I say these things because we're about to have the invitation song now. If you need your family for any reason, if you need to talk to God, if you need prayers for strength, protection, wisdom, forgiveness, God will be there for you. We will be there for you because we're family. We all fight the same battles and we all get there together. So if you need God, why not summon your will? Come now. <laughs>